uh, what was it, 5.15? Yeah. Yep, 5.15 in uh, Thurston, 205. So please uh, uh, show up there. Um, so, um, and uh, uh, the, uh, I know the uh, assignment two is due uh, on Monday, the day before the exam, but uh, so in assignment two, I would say like the first three problems out of five are the ones which are, we have already kind of talked quite a bit about it earlier, so you can get a guess of what sort of pro <coughs> problem I'm at. I won't ask things like the last two problems in assignment five, which I'm covering now. Okay. And, uh, and the solutions to assignment five would be, uh, uh, let's see, uh, we'll have an extra office hours tomorrow uh, evening, uh, and probably got that email it's sent yeah. out, yeah. And uh, um, so I think what we can do is make the uh, solutions uh, for the first three problems available right after it's due, so in case you want to have a copy. But if you have solved it, you would know. Uh, so we'll do that. Okay, so, yeah. uh, we'll make it available the evening before 5 p.m. when it's due. So okay. Okay. So and uh, um, um, uh, okay. And uh, as far as the uh, uh, exam goes, it will be right here in class uh, uh, and scheduled time. I mean, it's, uh, an open book, open notes. I don't have any. Uh, restrictions and just I think we emphasize on the concepts uh, rather than uh, remembering formulas and all that. So, okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, let's uh, get going. So essentially, uh, we are uh, in, in in the last class. I, I said we have kind of finished discussion of how how uh, uh, we understand uh, electrons and their how, how what we have developed a machinery to ha handle uh, their electro uh, to find energies to find momentum and currents and all that uh, <coughs> thinking about it completely quantum mechanically uh, but uh, uh, as you know we have looked at the very simple problem where electron is in a ring or in a free potential There's, there are no potentials in its way right and now uh, what we want to do is move towards semiconductors or metals or uh, things where the electron sees as it moves along a periodic potential of an arrangement of atoms. Uh, and uh, we want to see how, uh, what we'll see is most of the stuff we have talked about remains pretty much the same, uh, but uh, some of the new concepts that emerge are absolutely critical and that's what we're going to uh, now look at. Okay? So uh, the first things first, I mean if I have a one a completely free electron, we know its energies are, are uh, uh, parabolic, and I'm not going to try to write it over again, but it's 8 squared k squared by 2 mass, 2 times mass, where k is 2 pi by the wavelength, right? And we can write down its wave functions. They are plane wave-like wave functions, like e to the power i k dot x, right? So or k dot r over square root of a volume or an area <coughs> or a length. Right? So uh, what now we are going to ask is uh, what happens to these two things, which are absolutely central because uh, the energy and the wave function, uh, once I put it in a crystal, right? that, that's really what we're going to ask now. But before we go to the crystal, we, can, uh, we know that a crystal, for example, a silicon crystal uh, would have silicon atoms where uh, each atom is bonded to the next nearest neighbors. And there is another one here. And, and so it infinitely repeats, right? So it's a periodic crystal, a periodic arrangement of atoms uh, with a very characteristic distance between the two atoms. Uh, we can call that A uh, as a, uh, later on uh, we'll make it much more precise. This is a, a you know, periodicity of the lattice, uh, not of the atoms, but of the lattice. We're going to make this more precise later. Okay. Uh, but uh, so uh, now, uh, but then if we actually look at uh, an atom like silicon, or hydrogen, or you know, germanium, uh, gallium, or nitrogen, gallium nitride semiconductors. These are uh, or graphene. These uh, atoms have quite a few electrons, right? no, uh, uh, and and a uh, uh, lot of things we have talked about in the beginning were single particle, single electron picture. And then we said, well, if I put a lot of them, then they must follow Pauli exclusion principle and Fermi Dirac distribution, right? So now we want to kind of uh, initially make sure that uh, we understand which electrons are we talking about for the rest of the course. We'll see that we will be very you know, fortunate enough to not uh, have to talk about a large number of electrons. It's only the outermost electrons, outermost shells. The ones inside, we won't bother about them in this course most of the time. Right? 
but then we want to see why. Why is it that you want to? Uh, you can actually <coughs> neglect them uh, and neglect all the core electrons, if you might. Right? So uh, um, one of the things we actually uh, spent quite a bit of time trying to derive. So uh, let me just sketch this uh, anyway because we're going to use this. So a free electron. Uh, energy versus K. Uh, uh, so these are the allowed energies for the free electron, and if it's in a ring or in a square area, you know, in a 2D or 3D, it always looks something like this, right? And uh, uh, and the these were eight square K square by twice mass of the electron, uh, free electron. Uh, now, once your electrons are in the, if we look at uh, electrons in silicon crystal, they are really not like this. Eh? They look quite a bit different. But we want to kind of uh, uh, zone in and see that there are a certain fraction of electrons, specifically the ones in the outermost shell, that actually look like this. And the ones deep inside look very different. Their energies look very different. Right? And to, to kind of get to that uh, uh, sort of a picture, uh, and, and the wave function, uh, let's write it in three dimensions, for example. Uh, if I have a k vector, if I choose a certain k, then uh, it's 1 over square root of volume e to the power i k dot r. Right? So that's the wave function. And these, uh, the, and these are the energies. And this is essentially what you call is eigen system. When you sh solve the Schrodinger equation, you get both the wave function and the eigenvalues. Right? So, so, so it's an eigenvalue problem. Uh, and these were achieved by get, solving the Schrodinger equation. And from here, we were able to calculate group velocities or currents or momenta and all that stuff. Right? So, uh, but uh, OK. so. Let's look at the simplest atom, which is the hydrogen atom, uh, which will be kind of a model for us. Uh, and and uh, so essentially, the idea is there will be a nucleus. And the nucleus, there are protons and neutrons. And the nucleus is positively charged. Uh, so if it's hydrogen, it's plus 1. Uh, but if it's silicon, it's 14, and, you know, and, and, and so on. So, so I mean, uh, different, the atomic number is the amount of positive charge on the nucleus now, right? And now uh, we're going to say that uh, uh, if I had just one atom and the electron is moving, and then it sees this potential, then that's clearly a Coulomb potential, right? So, so it's a negatively charged electron, um, with minus 1.6. Uh, so electron charge is Q, minus 1.6, 10 to the minus 19 Coulombs. So it'll be attracted. So, but so it's a very deep potential well. It will really kind of fall down. It, you know, the the positive charge will try to pull it, and therefore the potential will look something like that, right? A very deep well. It goes as 1 over r and all that sort of Coulomb potential, attractive potential. And, uh, uh, and, and this problem was really solved by Bohr and Schrodinger, uh, essentially where the Coulomb potential, uh, instead of the completely free electron where your potential energy was 0, now you have this big well, right? And when, when they solved it, they got these energies, which are the you know, very uh, uh, well-known uh, energy levels of the hydrogen atom, right? Uh, and then they go as and a minus 13.6 electron volt over n squared, where n is an integer. You know, n is equal to 1 is minus 13.6 eV below what you call as the vacuum level. So this is where the electron is completely free. It's not bound to this uh, nucleus, right? So it can go through. So this is minus 13.6 eV deep. Then minus 13.6 over 4 is the next level. And then you know, a little more, and, and, and so on, right? So, so essentially, you can imagine it, it kind of plug in n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, and all that. And you get these energies. Right? So these are the eigenvalues of, uh, elect of an electron in, for one hydrogen atom. And if I were to now kind of ask, what is the density of states of this? You know, and uh, from here, uh, in the 3D problem, uh, we, we had found that the density of states looked like square root of energy. I think you're solving it also in your assignment problem. This is the density of states, meaning how many energies can I find within a win window of E and E plus dE, right? And this was the for the free electron. And so what, what, what this means, so because there are continuous num number, I mean, quasi-continuous number of states available, you can count, and you see the density number of states increase like that, right, with energy. Now, the question is, what is the density of states for the hydrogen atom? How does it look now, right? What would that be? For this one, uh, yeah. Anybody take a guess? I mean, it, we can see it here. So, if I were to plot the density of states now, right? 
So uh, scales are zero EV is electron is completely free. This is minus 13.6 electron volt. That's the first in the ground state of the electron in the hydrogen atom, right? And if you kind of hit it with a photon, you can go up here and it, it and it, it relax and emit light and all that stuff, right? So that's how people figured out these energy levels. Unless you're making yeah. approximations, the density of states isn't a continuous function. You have to Very good point. States. That's exactly right. So it's not even a continuous function. It's basically a bunch of you know, steps, or, or not, not steps, it's a, just a delta function, if you might. And then this state can hold two electrons. So it's a, you know, and, and then you go here, that's another state, and that's another state. It's not a continuous function. And then each of them, I mean, th th this is, let's say, 1s, and 2s, and 2p. And uh, again, in, in you know, if you have done a basic quantum course, you would say s orbitals hold only two, and p orbitals there are px, p, i, p, z, so they can hold six, and so on. So you can, you can hold, put six electrons here, two here, two here, and so on. And as you go higher, you can have more and more degeneracies. But the main point is it's really the density of states, if you might, you can still define it. It's just a very sharply peaked function. It's a delta function here. I mean, there's a very precise energy. And if you go a little bit off from it, those energies are not allowed in, in this potential well. Right? So that's, that's what it really means, right? the, the density of states. Right? Uh, is that clear? And then when you go out into the, so you can kind of see that this will start bunching together, you know, uh, uh, closer and closer. But by the time you go out here, what happens to the density of states for the free electron now? Now, this is in vacuum, right? Free electron is vacuum. And in vacuum, you get a 1 over square root of energy. You get this out in vacuum, right? Because now, now it's, if it had that much energy, it's not, yet, not bound to the potential hydrogen atom, right? So, so uh, now, uh, let me uh, actually not try to go uh, uh, to the high energies, but I'm more interested in, in, in the electron energies in the crystal. Now I'm going to take this and put another nucleus next to it, and another, and so on. So I'm going to build a periodic crystal now, right? So, uh, so in a periodic crystal, now you can see the potential go back up and then it'll come back down again, right? And then again go back up, and 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 it'll be basically a repeat uh, potential of this, you know, periodically repeat at a, a, a lattice constant of a, if you might, or or a, a distance, a, a certain distance. But uh, what I'm trying to now get to is. Uh, uh, let's uh, not worry about hydrogen now. Let's say these are silicon atoms for like here. Let's say it's silicon now. And it's kind of same. Silicon has more neutrons, so there's a little more Coulomb attraction because, uh, you know, larger number of positive charges. But essentially, the, again, the potential is looking like that for the electron to go through. And exactly in the same way, there'll be some, you know, electron states that will form like that and so on. This is what's going to happen, right? Let's just look at what are the orbitals. Because we're talking about silicon, let's look at specifically what sort of uh, S and P orbitals will be involved here. You know, we can just uh, take a quick uh, look at it. And I have linked this uh, kind of a very useful website uh, uh, of the periodic table. Uh, and. Uh, <coughs> OK, so um, this is linked on your uh, class website. So you can, uh, uh, essentially, you can kind of zoom in and, and, and say that, well, you know, click on silicon or carbon, and it'll tell you which orbitals are filled, you know, s orbitals, p orbitals, and all that. I mean, it's kind of nice. You can obviously do it by yourself, but it's, uh, so what, basically, what it's saying is if I choose silicon, I have one s orbital that's filled with two electrons up and down spin, two s orbital filled. 2p is completely filled, and 3s has two electrons, and 3p has two. This is empty, I mean partially empty. And uh, now in, in uh, chemically, what happens is, uh, you can see now, uh, uh, you know, if I were to combine uh, you know, 1s, 2s, and 2p, that's a closed sh shell. You know, that, that uh, you know, 1s has two electrons, 2s has two electrons, and 2p has uh, six electrons. So six plus four is 10. And that is neon. So that's like a noble element. I mean, that's a completely closed shell, right? It doesn't want to do any business in ex exchanging electrons. So that part is a closed shell. So we are kind of neon plus four electrons. You know, that's what we mean here, right? So neon, and then, all right, we go one, two, three, and four. So four extra protons and four extra electrons for, for, for silicon. 
And so these are the four electrons that form the four bonds. You know, that these are shared between one silicon atom and the next nearest neighbor. And so it's, it's, it has four electrons to share. And though they start out uh, as one, one S has two, two uh, sorry, that's uh, one S, two S, and three S, right? Three S. So I, I can write it as a neon. I'm just counting electrons now, right? From the core, you know. Uh, 1s, 2s, 2p, and all that. So they formed a closed shell, and then I'm left with 3p and 3s. So two electrons in 3s orbital and two electrons in 3p orbitals. And there are three 3p orbitals, p, x, p, o, and p, z. Uh, this program is nice. You can also see the shape of the orbitals. You can go in there. It will show you here's the p orbital shapes in meaning. What does that mean? So if I take, if I find the psi of that orbital, you know, you solve this really horrendous, you know, Schrodinger equation for the silicon atom. Only the atom, not a crystal. You know, only the atom. And you say, well, what's my psi of this p orbital, 3p x orbital, right? Then plot that wave function in real space. Uh, that's how it looks. It has like lobes and all that stuff. It's not a plane wave. But what we are plotting is effectively the same deal as what this is for the free electron. That is for the electron in the silicon atom. Right? So that's what we're plotting there. And uh, uh, okay, so uh, but the outermost. Uh, so essentially, what happens is these four electrons, two plus two. Uh, they, uh, uh, um, if I look at the uh, you know, deep states here, the core states here, two s two, two p six. That's neon, right? So I'm expanding that out. So let's see, in a silicon atom, uh, a silicon crystal, I can put, you know, here's my 1s state, 1s state energy, right? kind of very deep, you know? And uh, I can put two electrons there, two electrons here, two electrons here, in, for every atom, they're like that. And uh, 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 these electrons are seeing a very, very high potential. So in, in a certain way, they, they are completely shielded, their wave function, if you might, is not aware that there is another silicon atom five angstroms away. It's completely unaware of it. Right? It has that's the meaning. It is not participating in chemical bonding. This is, this is a core level, and this is typically few kilo electron volts below below the uh, vacuum level. Kilo electron volts. As, as you add in more nucleons, uh, it get the potential well gets deeper, as you can imagine. Right? More and more positive charge, so it gets deeper, and so. So this is few kilo electron volts below the vacuum level. It was 13.6 eV for hydrogen, but now it's few kilo electron volts. And that's why if you want to kind of pull that electron out, you have to come in with a very high energy photon, like an X-ray or something. You know? Then you can kick that electron out. But if you just apply a few volts in a transistor, you are never going to be able to mess with that electron. It's very deep. You know? so, does that make sense? I mean, so, so that's OK. So these are very deep electrons. And now, if I have a silicon crystal with big N atoms, Maybe I, I, I again want to plot my density of states now, and you can tell me uh, what will happen here. Right? How many states can I have? So these energies, because they are unaware, they're not interacting with other atoms, these energies stay put as well. They don't change. They stay put. And, and therefore, here, how many states will I have? 2n, right? Because each atom can give me two electrons, so I basically get you know, a delta function, if you might, or a very, you know, delta function is a mathematical abstraction, but this is 2n. That's how many electrons I can fill in that. And it's very sharp because it's not interacting with other states. And then you go to 2s and 2p, all of them, I mean, 2s will also have 2n electrons, right? 2p will have 6 times 2, so that will be, right, uh, to, uh, to, uh, 12n, right? electrons and so on, right? So you'll have these very uh, sharp peaks of energies till you go, till you kind of close the uh, you know, uh, neon orbit, if you might. Till then, all of them will be very sh sharp and very sharply peaked. And you can count how many electrons based on how many electrons fit in that orbital. Right? But then you reach a situation. Let's le look at 3s and 3p now. 3s and 3p states, uh, let's say uh, 2s, 2p. Uh, all three, y and z, uh, not, not very important. So what I'm saying is these wave functions do not kind of see the next nearest neighbor. They stay put inside. And but now I reach. Let's look at these two. So I reach this one, all right, and and this one. So now these for these electrons, you can see the potential barrier to the next 
our atom is very small now. Right? And so what happens is the wave function, if you might, the electron uh, kind of starts leaking into the next you know, uh, nearest neighbor's part, and this also starts leaking a little bit to the next nearest neighbor part. And then they start interacting as a result. So the electron uh, spends part of its time, some small fraction of its time, inside the barrier because it's a wave, it can penetrate into barriers just like you know, light can go through. Uh, um, glass and all that, so it's very very similar. It can penetrate, and we'll talk about the. Uh, th this is a, so effectively what's called tunneling. An electron can tunnel in a little bit into the distance here, and and the higher you go, the higher energy. You can see the barrier is smaller, and so it penetrates even more, right? So so essentially here it will penetrate even more, and so so they interact even strong, uh, stronger with each other. So the the higher we go in energy, the more aware those electron states are that there's another atom sitting next next you know next in the next nearest neighbor. So what happens is these energies, which were very sharp because of no interaction, here what happens is instead of having a very sharp energy here, this will actually broaden. It will bunch. Uh, so essentially, these energies will broaden out. You know? And then and, and it will form what we call now as a band. This is the first encounter of a band. It will form a band. It will broaden out. And uh, we'll see very soon that the thick uh, or the bandwidth or the energy bandwidth of this is uh, uh, proportional to how strongly they interact here. So, so, and then we'll, we'll look at those things. So the next one also will broaden out like that. And I shouldn't have shared it yet. So it'll also broaden out like that. And, and the deep ones remain like delta functions, pretty much. So that's the whole scale of energies. From, and then all the way out here, there's vacuum. So zero, you go in kilo electron volts, you see these very sharp spikes in density states. You go here, sharp spike. And then finally, you come to the top, few electron volts below the vacuum. And then you will see bands. And, and, and this happens for every crystal, not just silicon. So you take sodium. Potassium, metals, semiconductors, semi-metals, all of them do this. This is, this is the procedure. Uh, and then qualitatively, you can see, hopefully, you know, w why I'm saying that uh, uh, you it will know, broaden out, because primarily because the electron is now here. The electron wave function is localized, so its wavelength is very short. It cannot do anything, anything about it. it. It's short. But here, its wave function can delocalize. Does that make sense? It can spread out a little bit. And we know one of the thing, very important things in, in, in quantum mechanics is, is if the wave, wavelength, uh, if the wavelength is very short, the energy is large, and vice versa. If you let the wavelength spread out, the energy can be lowered. So that's the idea of delocalization. And for these states, we are letting it spread out. Therefore, it kind of lowers, but it also kind of, you know, so you know, the, the, if I were to put in just this much electrons, its energies would be lower than if it, you know, all of them were there. So it actually, uh, and then it spreads out. We'll quantitatively look at these, these things uh, very soon. Uh, okay, so now, uh, in, in, uh, and then this is very similar to, again, the periodic repetition of uh, elements. You know, hydrogen uh, is, is a very reactive gas, but helium uh, is, is very unreactive. Typically, helium is plotted there, but yeah. Uh, lithium is very reactive. Uh, chemically, electronically, and, and uh, neon is very unreactive. So you have this periodic repetition, right, for atoms. And you will have, similarly, a periodic uh, of being extremely, conduct, uh, extremely chemically reactive and being completely chemically inert. Right? In a very same way, in a solid, now as we fill electrons in the solid, we start from the bottom and we fill, 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 and all that, right? And at some point, I'll run out of electrons, depending upon the where that thing is in the periodic table, because the, the, the place or the atomic number of that element is the number of electrons you have right, per atom. Right? 14 here, uh, carbon is 6, and so on. Right? So that's how many electrons you have. What does that mean? Uh, if I have 6, I start filling from here, and I run out somewhere here. Right? If I have 14, I run out there. And you can see now that uh, as a result of this picture, too, we'll have a periodic repetition of metals and semiconductors, too if you form a crystal with that atom. Does that make sense? I mean, so, so instead of just being the atom going between chemically inert and chemically very reactive, now we're saying that if I fill, uh, if I make a crystal out of it, and I look at this picture, I can say now that as I fill electrons, for example, I fill electrons for 
uh, silicon, and I feel you can count now in silicon. What will happen now is you will run out of electrons by filling this band, and there'll be an empty gap here, and then there'll be a band next to it. So now this is a full, fully occupied band, and uh, we'll look look at it very soon now and prove that this is an insulator. It it, it cannot conduct. I go. Uh, 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 if I, you know, increase and kind of go back and add a little more electrons, maybe come back to potassium or calcium, then you will fill it till here. Some more extra electrons, right? And then that is a partially filled band, and it will become a metal. And then so, so you periodically kind of, as you fill up, you can see it will periodically repeat. And, and uh, you can also use this table and look at properties and say, well, uh, I don't know, electrical conductivity, and, and you can see that uh, you know, these are very conductive, and then you go here, it becomes insulating, and so on, and it come back, conductive, insulating, and so on. OK, so uh, that's a qualitative picture, but is that clear, or any questions here? <coughs> All, right. All right, so now, uh, yeah. If we have an four empty spots in the 3P band, why do we have a filled band? Ah, very good point. So we are going to see now that uh, these orbitals don't remain separate. They form what's called an sp3 uh, bond. We are going to see that very soon. That's a good question. You're saying that if I have, uh, I had only partially filled p-bands, so I should be expecting a metal, right? That's probably what you're uh, trying to refer to, and uh, for silicon, for example. And, and, and the thing is, uh, once uh, these are atomic orbitals, you know, if you had a silicon atom, the orbital will definitely look like that, just an atom. But now when I put it in a crystal, that orbital gets deformed very much. And, and essentially, it gets, uh, uh, what happens is one s orbital, s orbitals are spherically symmetric. And three p orbitals, which will be kind of dumbbell shaped, like three of them, right? And they will mix together to form an sp3 orbital that looks like a tetrahedron, you know? so. It will look something like that. They mix together. It's a linear combination of these or, these states, and they mix and form that. Right? So it gets elongated along the, and that's how you know what is the crystal structure. You know? So so essentially, the atom here. So a silicon bonding is tetrahedral in space, you know? and then that's what that comes from this hybridization. Okay, we'll come to that. But uh, let's now make it a little more quantitative, and uh, there are two ways to approach this picture, and, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, one more thing I wanted to state here is, uh, again, I want to make a connection of where does this picture occur? Where does this free electron picture occur? Where does it look like parabolic? Where does the density of states look square root of energy for three dimensions? It looks like that, very close to where we call, this is the gap of the semiconductor, and very close to that. If you zoom in there, kind of zoom in there, you see that the energies uh, starting out in this band will look like a density of states will look like a square root of energy on that side, and also a square root of energy on that side. And this will be, we'll be calling this as the valence band, and this as the conduction band. You know, so so we're gonna, and most of the business we do with electronic devices or photonic devices, LEDs, lasers, transistors, all the action is right, right here. You know, not, we don't sample all the rest, and and therefore we'll spend quite a bit of time looking at carrier statistics and transport, and when you're doing these current calculations, you'll be summing over energies or k-states which are limited to this window, not, 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 not all these. And there's a good reason, because when you sum over any of these other things, you'll always get a zero, because the full band. You know? So we kind of uh, don't consider that, yeah. The silicon atoms are close enough together, and when the bands come together, do the electrons actually move from one to the other, or is that just like a... Yeah. Uh, really good question. So, uh, uh, le you know, b now based on, on this, uh, you can see that if I kind of squeeze it, you know, strain it and all that, I can change, uh, you know, the potential barrier and all, th all that sort of thing. So essentially what happens if I strain things, I can also make an electron, depending upon how I do it, I can make an electron, uh, the height much thinner, or the barrier much thinner and all that, so I can make it easier for the electron to move across. So you can have a transition. Uh, from, so the bands I, I plotted here are separated in energy like that, but they don't need to be. It really depends on the distance and, and, and the strength of bonding. The, the, it's possible that the bands can overlap. It's very possible, and in many of them they do. 
this will be called a semi-metal, for example. And so you can, or, or you can do it dynamically. You can strain something. We, we started here, and then you strain it or do something to it, and it, it starts kind of you know, spreading out a little bit, and you go from an insulator to a metal. You can make it transition in that way as well. So, so yes, the electrons, uh, if you're asking physically, are they tied to the atom, or are they moving? Uh, these electrons are completely tied to this atom. They're not moving, but those electrons are mo they're, they're mobile, and these are conduction electrons. They can hop around atom to atom, and they can move in the entire crystal so through the, one end to the other, and all that. So yeah. Okay. So uh, now let's uh, make this uh, picture uh, a little more quantitative, and and to make it quantitative, we have to learn one new tool. And I had mentioned in the last class that uh, this I will. Uh, essentially give you a summary and, and a handout. So you can read that. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, 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 as far as the slides go, it's uh, here. Uh, this is, uh, oh, it's called perturbation theory. It's a grand name, but I'll just show you it's a really simple idea. Uh, uh, and, uh, so, you know, the, and we'll kind of l collect the most important results. And once we write them down, we say, well, of course, it makes sense at least. The derivation of it, you can go through. I'm, I'm not expecting you to, you know, uh, uh, I, I, if you don't completely, uh, uh, if you want to understand the part of the derivation, which I'm not doing in the class, I'm very happy to explain. But uh, if, uh, 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 you, uh, I, I would be OK if you understand what the results mean, final results mean, and be, are able to use it. You know, so that will be OK for me. But uh, here's the idea, the very simple idea. What we are going to say, uh, there are two ways to go and find the electron energies in a, in a crystal. A, you start from an atom and say that I know all the energies of the atom. And I'm going to uh, uh, start with localized states and let them, you know, I'll, I'll turn on their interaction with the next state. You know. and, and that method is called a tight binding model. You know. And, and, and uh, the tight binding model, uh, uh, starts with the uh, localized electron energies tied to an atom and, 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 and says that uh, uh, I'm going to, so in, in a way, uh, what I'm go doing here is the interaction strength between, you know, between an electron here seeing the next nearest neighbor. Uh, so if they're completely non-interacting, you have pure atoms, right? silicon atom, and we know all these orbitals, for example. And then we start from here. You know and say that I'm going to now turn on the interaction and bring another atom close to it and let, let this electron sense the, the potential of the other atom. And, and this path of doing the physics is called uh, the tight binding model. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you just kind of turn on the uh, interaction. The other end of the spectrum is we can look at the electron was completely free and there was no atom in its path at all. Right? It was a completely free electron. And then I'm going to put in its path, uh, so essentially a potential for that electron, uh, the free electron was looking, uh, so it was moving, let's say, like that, and the potential was zero. That's free electron, right? And in its path now, I will uh, put a periodic perturbation, but I'll start with a very, very weak perturbation. This is a periodic potential. Why am I doing it? You already saw in the silicon atom the, the potential that the electron sees will be periodic, right? Uh, because of the periodic arrangement of atoms. So I'll turn this on, but I'll start from zero. I'll, I'll kind of have very weak perturbation, and then I'll turn on I'll, you know, uh, but, and increase the strength artificially. This is just, I mean, physically it has a one, one potential. But I'm mathematically, uh, if you approach it from a completely free electron and then on top of it build in this periodic potential, uh, 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 that, that, that in, a, in a way, if you, if you um, might, I mean, uh, um, so that's basically a different picture. I, I don't want to say we come from here uh, on the right side, but really you have an electron that's completely free, and we put a periodic potential in it, in its path, and turn on the strength. You know? So, uh, and that path uh, will, will be the part of uh, essentially what we are calling as kind of the uh, uh, first approach or the perturbation approach theory. We're going to take this approach. This is also perturbation theory. All of them are really perturbation theory. But you know, I'm, I'm, we're going to take this approach. Why? Because I spent like four classes, three classes, talking about the free electron, you know, and and we have developed the whole machinery for it. Wave function, you know, energy eigenvalues, density of states. We want to now see how does this 
how do the properties of the electron change because of this periodic potential. And that's uh, the change is what we are calling as we are perturbing the potential uh, for the electron. Right? So, so that's the approach we're going to take first. And later on, we'll apply the tight binding picture and then and, and see that essentially they lead to the same picture. In fact, uh, you can recover one from the other you know, where, where they meet in some sense. Okay? So we are going to take this approach uh, initially, the free electron approach. And then here's the basic question. We have a free electron and we have this periodic potential. And let's just do it in one dimension initially. X plus A is equal to V of X, you know, where the periodicity of this is A. So this is the new uh, thing that we have introduced in the path of the electron. And we already know that uh, if I had electron, you can think of it, we can apply a periodic, uh, or, or we can apply the periodic boundary condition too, so in which we put the electron on a ring. And in its path now, I have a periodic potential that looks like this. Does that make sense? In, on the ring. And the re reason I'm doing the ring again is because now we know that we have this discrete number of eigen quasi-continuous state of eigenvalues. And, we, were, we use that to find density of states, et cetera, right? So, so I'm going to uh, up, uh, take this approach where I put the electron on a ring again. We can do the 1D. And the 2D and 3D are relatively simple ex extensions of this. And we'll, we'll talk about that. But uh, is it clear what we are doing? We're basically take, going back to our 1D electron problem. We went, went on a little detour seeing what is the origin of this periodic potential. But now we're gonna, I'm not very interested at, as, at this point mathematically to model exactly that periodic potential, all I want to know is what happens if there's a periodic potential. That's really the question we're asking at this point, right? And what is its effect on the band structure, on the density of states, on the wave functions, and all that stuff. Right? And uh, let me just say that really this is the heart of all of condensed matter physics, this question that we're asking, that I'm going to put an electro, uh, in the path of an electron a sort of a periodic potential in a crystal uh, uh, what happens to all its physical properties, right? This electronic conductivity, current ca carrying capability, heat capacity, and all of them will be answered if I can find what is the energy dispersion and what are the wave functions. I can answer everything after that, right? What are its photonic properties, thermal properties? All of them are buried in this question. Right? So it's a very general question, and, and uh, therefore uh, people have spent a great deal of time trying to find ways to solve this problem as accurately as possible. So we're going to start with the things that uh, really strengthen our concepts of, of uh, what happens. I mean, we, we can intuitively, uh, hopefully we have an intuitive feel of how it changes and why it changes, and why is very important here. OK. so. Uh, uh, let's, uh, 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 and then you can see now uh, the problem then mathematically uh, the problem is the following that initially I had, uh, let me choose a state here, okay. here's a state which has uh, uh, you know, a wave vector k and energy ek, right? so I can call it, uh, remember I've used this notation earlier, it's just an abstract, it's a vector if you want to think of it this way, this is a state k, right? this is a state k and associated with it, there's a wave function. Here's the wave function. Right? Associated with that state, there is, there is a energy eigenvalue. Here's the energy eigenvalue. Associated with that, there's a momentum, there's a current, all that stuff. Right? So we, we, can, we, we know all that now. Right? And, uh, um, so, and this is the situation if I have a completely free electron right? when the potential was zero. Right? There's no potential. Right? And the question we are now asking, so here's, here's the way to state that mathematically. We're saying I had my initial Hamiltonian, if you might, here's H0 acting on an unperturbed state, which is, say, K. And I know its energy is an EK and its eigenvalues, I mean, eigenfunction is K. Does that make sense? So this is the vector. And I said that if you want to consider it as a, uh, as a uh, you know, um, if you find, want to write down the real space wave function, what we do is kind of, uh, the abstract picture is you project it on x, but physically all, all it is, is is e to the power i k x. You know? That's how you find the wave function. And we write it as psi of x, or psi sub k of x. Either way, you know, this is the wave function. So, so, uh, so you can write it instead of writing like that. Here's the Hamiltonian operator acting on k and giving you eigenvalue times the k. Or you can write it as h naught acting on a wave function is the same deal, really. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. 
Uh, are you comfortable? I mean, this is, again, nothing new yet. It's just so here's a statement of uh, that problem that uh, uh, these wave functions are, you know, kind of, th these wave states are special. They're, they're states of definite energy. And that's why you're getting the definite energy here. Right? So we've spent some time discussing about that. And, and now the question is, is really the, the, the following. So instead of k, instead of writing the whole wave function, I'm going, just going to write k, the vector k here. You know, just, yeah, just for economy of expression, if, you, if not anything else. And now, uh, and this Hamiltonian was just what? Minus h squared over twice mass of electron and d2 by dx squared for the one-dimensional problem plus no potential, zero potential. Flat. And now we're going to add this periodic potential v of x. And so h0 has changed to something else. I mean, this is a new term now, right? And this I'm going to kind of call as a perturbation, w, let's say. This is a perturbation. I'm going to just say this is a perturbation. So I'm going to change. Here's h0, which is the original Hamiltonian, plus a periodic potential now. Right? So I'm going to not bother so much about the details of what, what these terms are as much as this changes into h0 plus an additional new term. And now, we have to be a little careful because uh, when I perturb it, I am not guaranteed that that state, that k state, is an eigenvalue anymore. I'm not guaranteed anymore. Does that make sense? When, because uh, it was an eigenstate when I did not have w. And now when I have changed it, it need not be an eigenstate. It could be, but it need not be. Right? So what I say now is, there is uh, I, uh, so just like the Hamiltonian changed with this extra term, which is the perturbation, I will have a new set of eigenstates, a new set of eigenstates. And this is a psi, which I don't know yet. I don't know yet. This is a new, new eigenstate, which has a new eigenvalue. This, uh, this energy eigenvalue got changed, too, into something else. It's a new, new energy value and psi. So this is... Uh, if you look at it, this is really the full Hamiltonian. If you solve this, then you know you can. But uh, the problem is, even with the simplest periodic potentials, uh, this is unsolvable. The Schrodinger equation for the simplest periodic potential. Here's an example. Let's. I'm going to use this. Uh, this is going to be a very important potential for us in this class. Uh, One-dimensional cosine potential. Okay, v of x. Let me write it as w because I've been using this. Is the w is the perturbation now? Is uh, and there's a good reason I'm writing it this way. So minus two times, you know, uh, g and cosine of two pi over a times x. This is a periodic potential, one-dimensional periodic potential. <coughs> and this two pi over a, you can see it's two pi by some sort of a wavelength. We're going to refer it to as g. Uh, which is a reciprocal lattice vector. We are going to come back to this later on. And then this is labeled by G. So, so you can write it as cosine of GX as well. So I'll just erase that. Write it as cosine of GX. So what I'm trying to say now is, is uh, if I write this whole thing out and, and, and say that, well, why am I going through all this business of doing perturbation theory, et cetera, et cetera, why don't I just plug that in here? minus two times ug cosine gx and solve my Schrodinger equation, right? Uh, you can solve it. And then if you solve it, you get your eigenvalues. You can find your new EK diagram. And the problem is this is mathematically unsolvable. Analytically, you can't solve it. You know, that's the problem. And, uh, and th that's really one of the problems with many of the quantum mechanical problems that analytically there are only a certain set, restricted set of problems that are exactly solvable. You have an analytical formula for it. And they are the following. There's a free electron. Obviously, we have solved it. We know that's solvable. Uh, there's a uh, particle in a box problem where you have a quantum well. Uh, there is the hydrogen atom, one of the hardest f exactly solvable problem, uh, which is what you know, Niels Bohr and Schrodinger solved. Uh, the harmonic oscillator, which is a, which a parabolic potential. Yeah. So, and, and there's a delta potential. That, th this is it. I mean, there's no other potential in which you can solve it exactly. And when I say is you can't solve it, it's not like uh, I can always you know, numerically solve it. Right? But I can't get an analytical expression for the answer. You know, that's what I mean to say. Right? It's, it's not analytically solvable. And, and uh, that is the reason why, uh, because once you have a formula, 
you know how to change quantities if I want to make the band gap larger, which term should I change and all that. Because if I have only numbers, I can't see that, right? And so the analytical part is very, very important. And this whole machinery of perturbation theory I'm going to just describe is developed just for that reason, you know, uh, to be able to understand and be able to solve. And even with, you know, with pen and paper, you can answer a lot of very important, profound questions about this. Does that make sense? That's the reason why we are doing this. Yeah. OK, so we basically want to solve this. And what I'm going to write down now are two uh, uh, results uh, uh, which are the result of the perturbation theory, and I'm not going to try to derive it. Okay? So essentially, here's the, here's the problem. Uh, because of a, I have already perfect, uh, I have an exactly solved problem, which is this problem. I, I know how to solve this. Okay? Does that make sense? I, I know how to solve this. It's a free electron, or a parabolic potential, or hydrogen atom, whatever. For us, in this course, it's the free electron problem. Exactly solved, right? And now I'm going to impose on it another potential. Now tell me what are the new solutions, what are the new eigenvalues, and what are the new eigenfunctions. Yeah. Uh, and then that's the perturbation problem. That's you know, in words. Right? So, so what I'm going to uh, then do now is, is uh, uh, write down these two important results of perturbation theory, which will give us exactly that, those answers. <clears throat> and just to repeat, why am I doing this? Because I all the physical quantities I want about a semiconductor and an structure will be buried inside that answer. And you, you know, if, you, if you apply the right operators or the right formula, you can extract it from there. Right? So, uh, so, uh, so here, here are the uh, results of, uh, and this is for this part of the course. Uh, what we're doing is uh, the time-independent problem meaning the time independent Schrodinger equation. And uh, sometime after, the uh, I think the second prelim, when we talk about light matter interaction or transport problem, we'll look at how the time dependent part. You know. So the results are actually, uh, uh, the first way to look at it, we're going to look at it in two ways. One is the uh, matrix result, and the other is uh, the analytical result. And both of them will be very useful. <laughs> So a matrix result is uh, uh, is the following. So uh, you want to kind of you want to solve this problem, right? Uh, and now the psi, <coughs> which is a new state of the quantum system because it was initially in a let's say state k, but now you have turned on this periodic potential, the new state can still be represented. The new state can still be represented as a sum over the old states. You can always do that because the old states, which are e to the power i k x's and all that, they form what you call as a complete set of functions. So any function in, in, in the x axis, any function mathematically, you can write it as a superposition of these states because this is the theorem of Fourier. Right? I mean, Fourier says that you give me any function in x and I'll write it as a you know, linear superposition of these states. And these are the e to the power i k uh, in, in one dimension. If you remember, it's e to the power i k n times x, right? And this is just the length, 1 over length, right? in one dimension. So, <coughs> so we are saying that, well, uh, OK, I've turned on a periodic potential. And I know my state now, which is a new eigenstate. It is a new eigenstate. But I know for sure. Basically, Fourier guarantees me that I can still write the new eigenstate as a sum over all eigenstates. No problem, right? That, so essentially, all the information about this periodic potential is buried inside this string of ANs, you know, these coefficients. They capture what happened to the system, right? It's all in, the, in those series of numbers. And so now, uh, uh, so you sum it over all ends, and here, here's your state. And when we say matrix uh, in, 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 in the physics here, what, really, what it really means is if, if I take all these ANs, so I can start with maybe label them in some way, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, and all that. And I take all these numbers, and I arrange them in a minus 2, A minus 1, A 0, maybe A 1, A 2. So I arrange all these As, these coefficients, as a column in a column, right? So that's a vector now, right? That's a vector, a column of numbers, right? Column of numbers, these numbers are just the coefficients of those states. Does that make sense? So, so, so for example, 
for example, uh, if, I, if I choose a state which is very, very close to the lowest energy here, let's choose a state very close to lowest energy, but a little bit more, a little bit more here. Uh, sorry, a little less here, a little less here, and all. So essentially, its k is very close to zero, right? And then I, I look at what is its, uh, uh, you know, how will that look? So it will be basically zeros uh, all the way, and then when you come close to minus two, maybe it will be minus point. Uh, sorry, it will be maybe point one, then point five, and point, you know, or something like that. Uh, point two, and then it's, it'll, it'll go back down again. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? It's just a way of how how much of that state is in the, in the in the superposition. That's physically what it means. But the main point is this is a vector, and this physically is exactly what we call as the. You remember I was saying the state vector. This is the state vector. This is an arrangement of numbers. You know? And uh, the problem we are trying to solve is, uh, is, 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 is this is a state vector. It's a series of numbers. And this is how all the numerical work today is done. You're doing DFT, first principles calculation. This is what you're doing. You have this set of vectors. You know, uh, and you're calculating the energy band structure of complicated crystals you know, and all that. This is what you're doing. You have the wave function, uh, a state, uh, which you know, is, a, is a superposition of something that you already know how to solve. Does that make sense? I mean, this is, this is known, and this is unknown, right? And we want to find that. And therefore, we want to find the coefficients. Essentially, therefore, one of the tasks would be to find that wave vector, this, this vector, not a wave vector, but the state vector, right? So this is the state vector. And now, uh, the problem we're trying to solve is the Hamiltonian uh, with a periodic potential acts on this state and gives you a certain energy times that state. You know, I want to find those eigenvalues. And right, I can see this is uh, the most standard matrix problem, right? I mean, it's a matrix problem. Why? Because uh, let me write it out now. Uh, H zero plus a perturbation potential, psi is a linear superposition of a n is equal to an unknown energy times that same superposition, right? So the matrix part, I'm, it turns out I'm deriving it now, but uh, okay. So I, 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 you can see what I really have here is I'm ru running this sum over n's, right? And then n's are all the allowed states here on the k point, you know, uh, all these uh, for the particle on a ring, it was two pi by l times all these integers, right? Running it over those. So it's actually really an infinite set, right? Because it goes all the way, right? So it's an infinite set. But from all practical purposes, we'll be dealing with five or four. Most of the time, it'll be two. You know? And then we'll be able to recover all our band structure story from just a two by two matrix. You know? But uh, the, physically, what we're doing is it's an infinite number of states, because the free electron problem, indeed, uh, can go to you know, plus infinity or minus infinity. In, but in practice, physically, you can see it's not infinite. Right? I mean, there, there are. Uh, 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 physical limitations to it. Uh, OK, so uh, is that clear what we wrote here? Essentially, just the, the problem now. The entire problem is stated as, as, as this uh, uh, you know, Hamiltonian plus this new periodic perturbation. By the way, this does not have to be periodic. But because we are going to talk about metals or semiconductors, we are putting in the periodic. If you have a defect in a semiconductor, this is also how you deal with it, deal with the problem. I add a, a perturbation to the problem. OK, so, uh, so this is uh, what you really have is then an infinite set of linear equations. And this is the basic problem of linear algebra, right? How do you solve this set of equations? And, and the way you solve now is uh, uh, you, can t you can see now that uh, um, so this is a, a coefficient. So I can take this thing over here, right? Uh, or in other words, I took the operator inside because this is a number. Operator doesn't do anything to the number, but then it acts on the state here. And when this Hamiltonian acts, the solved Hamiltonian acts on this eigenstate, it just gives you the eigenvalue of that, right? Because that's the solved problem, right? We've already solved it, right? So uh, I'll just write it in this way, OK? Uh, uh, um, um, OK, so let me write it this way, OK? H0 plus W. It's not very important to write down the full uh, solution at this point. Uh, okay. So uh, I, I think I just rewrote the whole thing. But what I want to do now 
is take this, uh, uh, you know, if you look at it actually physically, what we have in this equation is a statement about the equality of two vectors. You know. Here's a vector, which is a superposition of all these other, you know, ends with some coefficients. Here's another vector, right? And it, what it's saying is these two vectors are equal, meaning every coefficient also must be exactly equal. You know, right? Th that's the meaning of this equation. It's a vector equation, right? And what I'm going to do is instead of trying to solve the vector itself, I want to uh, uh, f look at the first row of equations. Essentially what we have is many rows because each n will lead to one row. So the way to do that is I'm going to uh, uh, close this on the left side. And essentially what, what does that mean? I'm going to take this vector and project it on say state one. One is you know, one of the states here. This is state one. And then the next one is state two and so on. Just project the thing into state one. Physically, what am I doing? Really, what I'm doing here is, uh, let me write this down. Energy is a constant. A n is a constant. So they just come out A n. And I get one, uh, sorry, a sum over n, n. That's what I get. So n projected on one. And physically, what that really means is it's an integral, right? It's a wave function integral from 0 to L around the ring of dx times psi complex conjugate of 1 times psi of n. That's physically what it means. This is the, what you call as the, you can call it projection or a matrix element. I mean, there are different names for it, but it means the same thing. right? So physically what we did was we took, uh, uh, many times in books it is written in terms of the wave function of this, and we just are using a vector term for it. That, that's the only difference here. Okay? And I think you know what that answer is. We have already talked about this. this is, these are all no orthonormal. I mean, all states are orthogonal to each other because these are exactly solved problem, right? So what you get here, what do you get here then? Right? So, so you get just A1, right? All of them go away. And you, for the first one, if I project it on one, I just get A1. And on the left side, I have to do the same. If I projected this vector onto the one axis, I must project also this vector to the one axis. So I must close one here. And again, one is, so I can slide it in till here, and I get something here, which is what we call as the matrix element now. Right? <coughs> now, uh, so what I get here is, here, let me write it out, A1 times, I'm going to just write it as H11. What is H11? And this is uh, uh, the kind of the important term uh, in this problem. It's H0 plus whatever perturbation you put in times one. So, so this is, and physically, what that means is I take the wave function of 1, psi of 1. I take wave function complex conjugate of this 1. It just happens to be 1 here. In the next term, it will be 2, and so on. So I take, and I have this Hamiltonian plus this perturbation sitting in between the two. So it acts on this, and then I integrate over all x. So that's physically what it means. This is the matrix element. Uh, uh, for uh, for that term, so H11 is this whole thing. But that's not all because I'm summing from so one, two, three, four, all that stuff. So I must go A2, and then I write it as H12 and H13 and so on, right? And uh, so H12, for example, would be. Uh, so the so second term here has 2, so this will become 2 and h12. So here what I have to do is take the wave function 1 still, complex conjugate, but this will be wave function of 2. Right? So I have to kind of do all this mix match now. Now, if I did not have this Hamiltonian term, that term is 0. That's guaranteed because 1 and 2 are orthogonal. But now I have the Hamiltonian sitting in between, and there's a periodic perturbation, and there is a good chance that some of them will not be 0. Right? And if they were all 0, then it's exactly solved. I mean, there's no, nothing to talk about. It's already done. But those uh, terms would be of most interest here. And, and uh, so essentially, by varying these quantities now, I have a second set of equations, H21 plus A2. Uh, Wait, did I do that? A3, yeah. A1, H22 plus A3, H23 plus all that. So you get basically a set of equations again like that, right? You can change. So this was by projecting 
this you know, state onto state one. The second equation of projective state two, state three, and so on. You continue doing that. And you get now, on the right side, uh, A2. And then similarly, the third equation will give you A3, and, and, and so on. Now I collect all of them, and I get my big matrix. And this is the, you know, uh, essentially, uh, this was Heisenberg's solution to all quantum mechanic mechanical problems. Right? So H11, H12. So I, I split it into a matrix form now, right? And, and you can see that uh, the vector that is going to multiply with is A1, A2, and so on. And on the right side, you have the eigenvalue that you are after times the A1, A2, and so on. So, so all the new physics is really buried inside these matrix elements. One, one, two. So you, and what, what do we need to know? We need to know our wave functions. So in general, let me write the H, N, M, right? H, N, M, any, you go in you know, uh, for, if you choose a, and I'll talk very soon uh, today about, uh, you know, what size do we determine, what's the problem, and how do you choose the size of the matrix and all that. But H, N, M will be, for example, here you uh, go, uh, I think we've been doing one and two, uh, so M and N, M and N, something like that. So, so you, you, uh, and we know these wave functions for the free electron, and we know now the periodic potential, so we, we should be able to evaluate this integral exactly for, for all these terms, and then you put them all in, and you have to solve this matrix equation, and when you solve it, let's say I had uh, three rows sub for a problem. Let's say I decide, and we'll, we'll do a three by three because we'll see the band structure, effective mass, and all will depend on a two by two and a three by three. But let's say we do a three, three rows, then uh, you can see that I'll get, uh, once I solve this problem, I'll get a set of three coefficients. And how many eigenvalues will I get for a three by three? Three, three eigenvalues. Right. So, I mean, that's right. So, but we'll get three. And it may be degenerate. All of them may be the same. They may be different. But we'll get, basically, the number of eigenvalues here is the number of rows and columns. And it's a square matrix here. It's a square matrix, right? So, uh, uh, and, you know, so th essentially, this is the statement also Heisenberg's quantum mechanics, which is H psi is E psi, uh, which is you know, where all these are matri matrices. This is the matrix mechanics version of uh, uh, Heisenberg before Dirac came and gave the, uh, Schrodinger and Dirac gave the analytical form for it. No, so, uh, no, very good point. No, E is a number, and it's a real number. This is the eigenvalue. And this is what we are after. We are after what are the values of E. You know? So that's what we are after. Right? So it's a number. And, and uh, whereas the psi, this whole thing is what we are calling a psi. This whole is the Hamiltonian matrix. And this is also psi, but E is a number. So, so, so essentially, one way to look at it is this is an operator that acts on a vector psi. Right? And, and it basically uh, gives you kind of the length, if you might, of that wave vector. And then it doesn't change the vector. Right? Now, if this state was not an eigenvector, it will, this operator will come in and rotate it or do something. It will point it in some other direction. That's what it will do. It, and that's mixing of states. But uh, when, when you have a, it will give you the eigenvalue. Right? So this is a procedure, uh, one, one of the procedures, uh, which is the matrix method. And this has no restrictions. The only restriction is, Numerically, if you're evaluating it, you have to choose, be judicious and choose a certain size of your set that you want to deal with, right? Because, you know, from the word, from the get-go, the quantum mechanical problem is an infinite dimensional problem. This is called the Hilbert space where you have infinite number of states, right? So, but then we have to choose judiciously how many states we want to include. And uh, the more states you include, the more accurate is the answer. But we'll see that for many things, we'll get away with two by twos and three by threes. But if you're doing DFTs or you know, some other first principle stuff, you generally include quite a bit more. You know, and then you get uh, more details. Uh, OK, so that's the matrix method. Uh, uh, and and uh, another way it's typically written is uh, you can take you know, this Hamiltonian matrix and take the energy to the left side, right? Minus E times, and you put in an identity matrix of the same size. 
and you multiply with the psi and you get a zero and this you can ask your MATLAB or Mathematica to solve it and it will just solve it. It will give you the whole eigensystem solutions uh, as an example. Uh, sorry, I'll try to, by the way, I'm going to uh, post this, uh, where is the screen down? Yeah. Uh, so I'm, uh, perhaps some of you have already used such things, but essentially I just wrote a three by three matrix here, right? And because we're going to use two, two by twos and three by threes, and you can now say, well, find me the inverse, find me the eigenvalues, eigenvectors. So here's the uh, inverse of this matrix. I mean, this single commands, right? This is Mathematica. And then its eigenvalues is two, one, one. Eigenvectors is one, one, one. These are the three eigenvectors, right? And uh, you can ask for the eigen system, which is saying both the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors paired together. You know, for eigenvalue two, your vector is pointing in that direction, and all that. So you get all that detail very easily in this problem. Yeah. So, and then uh, I've manually written it down, but you can write formulas for it and all that. You can put in your free electron if you might, and build a ten by ten or something like that, right? And uh, okay, so uh, what we are now going to uh, uh, do, yeah. Is this in reference to like the homework problem or something we're going to be doing? Uh, later on, not, not, not the second homework, but later on you will. I, I'll post this too so you can use this or you write your own on, with MATLAB and all that. So yeah. I don't think my programming skills are the best in, in this area, but I think you can use your own. So. OK, so uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, the matrices look abstract, but you know, when it comes down to evaluation, it essentially you evaluate numbers in the end. And then you get numbers and you plot them and all that. Uh, so what I want to show now uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, okay, one more thing uh, before we apply it. Uh, uh, so the, this is the matrix result. <coughs> so you have to solve this matrix and get eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. And the second one is I mentioned the an analytical method, which came from Schrodinger equation. And uh, uh, the way it answers this problem that uh, uh, you know, remember the question was what are the new eigenvalues and what are the new eigenfunctions, right? Once I put in a little uh, uh, perturbation on top of my solved problem. The analytical results, here are the results, I'll just write it down, okay? The analytical results say that the new eigenvalue, uh, eigenfunctions are equal to the old or the unperturbed eigenfunction of that state, right? Let's say I, I want to say uh, here's a state which is unperturbed, I'm going to just call it U, right? This is a state unperturbed. It could be any number, 20, 50, whatever you choose here in this series. It's an unperturbed state. And the new uh, eigenfunction, after you apply the perturbation plus W, this is that, is the initial one plus a sum where this state, the initial state is acting, uh, is interacting with many other states. It's interacting with a state there, or there, or there. And those states, let's call them as M, which is not the initial state. And these are different states, M. They, they run everything other than that one. Right? And, and, and then they, because of these interactions, it, uh, let me write it this way. So it's a superposition of many other states where M is not equal to the initial one right? that I'm interested in, the unperturbed one. And these coefficients, uh, are given, uh, uh, you know, th th this is the result that I'm not deriving, but essentially, let me write it down. It's the perturbation term W, and you find the matrix element between state M and the unperturbed state here. This term is exactly the same as here, except there's no Hamiltonian term here. The Hamiltonian term is exact, uh, uh, but the perturbation is the new here. Newton here, divided by energy minus EM. And you can write it as energy unperturbed. This is a result I'm writing down. This is in your, the set of slides, and it's uh, written down in, in, in detail there too. Physically, what are we uh, doing here uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, once I turn on this perturbation, what it's saying is that the new state, that this vector this is a state vector that perhaps was looking like that, and I turn on the perturbation and it maybe got rotated or something like that into some other state, and, 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 right? and, and that's the new state. Right? And just as a sanity check, if you turn off the perturbation, 
right? Completely, you should recover that. And obviously, I mean, that's yeah, that's fine. This is a, but the stronger the perturbation and all that, this is how, you, how, how you, this is the way the state changed, and the energy. Uh, I should write it. Okay, sorry. Uh, by the way, um, whenever in perturbation theory I write equal, it's in, that means it's approximate because none of this is exact, right? I mean, the reason we're doing it is because it's not exactly solvable. Similarly, the new energy. Maybe you can help me. What will be the first term with the new perturbed energies? The first term will be the original value, right? unperturbed energy, right? So of course, I mean that's, and then everything else will depend. So energy unperturbed is whatever it is before, and everything else now must depend on the perturbation term W, right? And when I turn it off, it should return there. Say. So the first term, what's called the first order perturbation theory, what you get is W U. So so essentially the perturbation term acting on the unperturbed state itself on both sides. And the second term is called second order perturbation theory. And what you do is now it can interact with all other states, just like we had before, all other states m not equal to itself. And what you get here is the same matrix element here, m with the perturbation on n, uh, sorry, with the unperturbed. Take square of that divided by E minus E unperturbed. OK, so those are the two main results uh, of quite a bit of uh, perturbation theory and derivation and all that. But that's, that's really the summary of all of it. So, yeah. Which E minus E unperturbed? Very good point. So here, these are the original solved eigenvalues. right? And here, what I have here, to be a little careful with this one, the way I've written here, this is the same as that one. <laughs> uh, I don't yet know. So I have to typically solve this problem again. I have to solve this problem again. And in this form, this is what's called, again, this is this names, but uh, this is called a Brillouin uh, Wigner, after the people who <coughs> derived it, Brillouin Wigner theory, where this energy is the one you're after. So you have to solve this equation now. So if it's interacting with five other states, so I have one over e minus this, and I have five such terms. So you get like a sixth order polynomial or something like that. So you get a six, six eigenvalues because five plus one is so six eigenvalues. But typically, the way this equation is used is not in this form. What you do here is you replace it with e m, you know, which is the uh, the mth state that you are interacting with. You replace it with e m, and and uh, that is a pretty good approximation for many things. And then that would be called uh, what's called the Rayleigh-Schrodinger theory. And uh, I, I will apply these, all these results now, the matrix and these things to the, to the particle in the periodic potential problem. Now. We will apply this to all these. Uh, and I think that's where hopefully, if, 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 if it seems unfamiliar now, it will become much more clear now. So, so these are the main results. Uh, uh, some things to note here uh, is uh, what, we had, what, what this equation here means is, is that the energy uh, so here's, let's say here's an unperturbed energy with U and EU. And uh, it could be a state uh, you know, somewhere here, uh, somewhere at the bottom, wherever. Uh, and and then, uh, and it has maybe some other states it could interact with. Here's M and E M. It could interact with that state. And when I don't have the periodic potential, it doesn't interact, and that's why we have already found these solutions, right? But the moment I turn on the periodic potential, it can mix up the state, this state with that state, right? And what is the effect of that mix up, right? What is the effect of that perturbation? That's what this equation is telling you. So it's saying that, well, this energy, will move, right? It will move. First, it will move by what's called the first order perturbation. So if you take the wave function of that state and you put the perturbation term, which is a cosine potential or whatever, integrate and you get some non-zero value, it will have a DC shift. This is called the DC shift. It will shift up or down, depending upon which way your potential goes. Typically, we'll have situations where this is zero, typically. Uh, and now this is kind of the important one, uh, which is second order perturbation that leads to effective mass and curvature of bands and all that. This is what leads to the, uh, all those quantities. And what it's saying is uh, uh, the following. Okay, so let's look at the Rayleigh-Schrodinger version where we replace this with the known value, you know, which is EM. 
what does that mean now? It's saying that this energy will shift and first things first, which direction will it shift? In? And you can right away say, will it go up or go down? Right? Because of the perturbation, you can say it from here. Right? So you can see there, uh, in the denominator, what you have is EM, let's replace it for now, EM minus EU. Right? EM minus EU. So now, if the, matrix, if the perturbation couples it with a state above it in higher in energy, right? if, it's, if, if, if this state gets coupled to a state higher in energy, then you can see the denominator is negative. Uh, no, is that correct? E M denominator is positive. Okay, okay. No, that's so. I, I must have flipped it around. Okay, sorry. E M. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. So I uh, this should have been E. Yeah, of course. Why? Why did I write it? It should be E here. Yeah, E E. And this is E M because I'm summing over M's, right? So so. Sorry about that. Okay. So now. Now, hopefully, you can see. So here, we replace it by, uh, wait, 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 what did I do here? EU minus EM, right? Why did, OK. So I replace it with EU if I were to not, uh, not try to find the, uh, you know, solve this equation all over again. So right? really Schrodinger approximation is a replacement of EU, not EM. You are right, absolutely right. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think I, I kind of messed up my notation here. EU, you replace it by the unperturbed value, which you know. Right. So uh, w um, what it'll do is, uh, just as a summary, I think we're kind of the end of this whole perturbation analysis, but what it will do then is if it interacts, because of the matrix element, which is non-zero, if it interacts with a state that's higher in energy, it will always get pushed down. It will always get pushed down in energy. And, and that's because this term becomes negative. So it gets, you know, energy is, uh, the shift in energy is negative. And not only that, the stronger is the matrix element, the more it gets pushed down. And the second thing is the closer is this energy to that, the more it gets pushed down. Right? So these two are extremely important intuitions we will carry over because it plays a huge role in the band structure, effective mass, curvature, and all that. So, Basic idea is if it interacts with another state, if the matrix element is non-zero because of the periodic potential, this state gets pushed down, this state will get pushed up because of this state. So it's always what you call as a repulsive interaction. You know? And this repulsion grows stronger if the energies are closer because it's in the denominator. And it goes stronger if the matrix element is larger. Right? And uh, uh, so, okay, what we'll do, uh, it's you know, we're out of time for uh, uh, now, but all this stuff which you know, if it had, uh, you know, definitely, if you haven't seen this before, it may look abstract, but at 5.15 in the class today, we'll apply this to the free electron problem. And today, we'll essentially kind of cover from here, recover from here, the concepts of band gap, effective mass, all that stuff of any crystal. We'll get it from, by just applying these results, okay? So we're applying the matrix or analytical right? We'll do both, we'll do both, okay, yeah. Okay, so we meet at 5.15 in uh, 2.05 Thurston. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.